Okay, welcome to my second talk today. Last year I submitted one, I got not accepted. This year I submitted two talks. Well, you get what, what you ask for. Um, this is about Samba being of help for other SMB vendors and to help, av help you avoid some of the hard work that we have been, done, have been doing over the past years um, with RPC services. So last, uh, this year um, at STC EMEA, I told people, hey, you could avoid most of the authentication issues in your service by using WinBind in your services. And yeah, Samba is modular enough these days that you can, with your fancy SMB2 server, just go out and have us do the RPC heavy lifting. Um, this talk will be like a bit stacked, so I will introduce what RPC actually is. Then I will talk a bit about Samba's internal architecture regarding RPC and how it evolved. And then I'll have a little demo time and then yeah, open for discussion where we could go. So SMB, I'm just, in Germany you say Olds to, Olds to Athens. Um, I don't know, Eulen nach Athen tragen. Telling the obvious to the audience or yeah, something. So what is SMB? It's an industry standard remote file protocol. Everybody knows and everybody in this room knows this. Um, high performance, good security, so all that you ask for. And if you look at the protocol specification, there's only 19 requests. And you ask yourself, hey, how hard can that be? And it can't be that, that difficult to implement SMB. And there's, in fact, there's many implementations in the industry. Gordon just came in and has one. Other people have implementations on their own. Um, and if you look at basic open, close, read, write, this is actually pretty easy, even on the server side. Um, it's not too difficult. Um, problems start once you really want to f want the full authentication piece. Um, there you have a lot of options. There you have really a lot. That's a whole world of its own, the authenticating, uh, authenticating using the different flavors of NDLM, using Kerberos, extracting session keys, getting all the crypto right. That's really not easy. Here, as I said, um, Samba's Winbind can be of help, and you can delegate this to us by you know, some standard library that we provided. So let's look at a connection from Windows. This looks all pretty easy. You have, you have your negotiate protocol, and in the negotiate protocol response, can you read that? Yes, looks like. In the negotiate protocol response, you say, hey, I'm speaking SMB 301. I have all sorts of 302. That's what it says. You're right. <laughs> that was my test if you're awake. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so I'm 302, whatever. Um, and this was from a Windows 2012 server, by the way. So no latest 311. Fancy. Um, and now we do our authentication. We do our NTLM SSB. I'm administrator somehow. You will find the administrator in here and so on. And what happens next is that somebody connects to a share IPC dollar. And if I go further down a bit, so this is kind of a bit connection setup stuff. The one I want to focus on is this one here. So client connects to share IPC dollar. Client then opens a file called server service. And what it does, it, it writes data to this file server service, write request. And it gets the right response. And then read request and what Wireshark makes out of this write and read response. What, what, any, any comment or? <laughs> this is Windows. Um, what they make out of this is a bind call. 
And I'll talk about what a bind call is in a minute. So here, you start asking yourself, wait a second. What is this? So you have all this stuff with fragmenting. Ronnie Zarberg, who has listened to Ronnie Zarberg? Apple guys, if you have a large RPC response, seem to send the RPC response in 256 byte fragments. PDUs called here, I believe. So there's, what's happening here is we have an inter-process communication share. Somebody opens a file there, writes into that file, reads from that file, and this is essentially a remote procedure call thing. Within this remote procedure call thing, you have a whole lot of, a whole world of your own that says, we have to format this properly, we have to marshal, unmarshal, we have to do authentication, we have a whole layer of authentication and crypto and signed seal on top of pure SMB. And this is really, if you start from it, start it from scratch, this is absolutely not fun. Oh, this is not even listing shares yet. We have to go even further down. Listing shares, oh, another open. So here we are with listing shares. I'll go into detail very soon. Oops, too many windows. Okay. If you want full Windows interoperability, SMB, including the authentication piece, is absolutely not enough. So you write your SMB server, you maybe get, you get the um, negotiate protocol right, you get the session set up, you get the, get the tree connect, and then you get the create file which opens files, you can read and write, and so on. But as I said, once you start, win uh, once you start trying with Windows, which for many SMB servers is the ultimate goal. You can't see your shares. So what is this? What is the file server service in IPC dollar? This is essentially an endpoint. It's a named pipe. It's an endpoint for remote procedure calls. And it is used for listing shares. And if you go back to OS2 days, listing shares was easy. There were special calls. Hey, by the way, we could ask Ron, we could tell Ronnie, use the old rap calls, revive the old rap calls. <laughs> so in the days before Windows NT, um, there used to be a separate subsystem in SMB, and this is still documented. If you Google for MS rap, there used to be a subsystem that had kind of hand marshalling all this stuff, like get me the list of shares, like Yes, here is the share names with, with the, its, um, its own set of rules for marshalling. It was, as I said, mainly used in OS2. The point is, this was not really sufficient to do what Microsoft at the, at the beginning of Windows NT had in mind, namely create a domain infrastructure. Domain infrastructure being, um, yeah, to do what Novell at its time had with its binary, essentially, um, create user and password database, group database, and so on, and do a Windows domain around some remote procedure calls. They wanted a domain controller, and they wanted many workstations be part of this, have that properly authenticated, and to do this, you need to be much more flexible than you, will, than you are with pure SMB and, and wrap on top and so Microsoft, with Windows NT, decided to go with a distributed computing environment um, RPC implementation. Um, Jerry, what was it? I think it, at that time, Paul Leach was around, and he brought it in. Yes, and so this is how they ended up with using DC RPC. So one developer brought that, with, uh, brought that with him, and he said, hey, we have this cool RPC infrastructure. Let's use it. And so this is... Pardon? There's more to it than that. There's quite a story behind that. Okay. 
Yeah, but that's, you can tell, maybe another talk. Okay, what's the RPC flow? This create file for server service. This one, no. This one here is opening a named pipe. What is a named pipe? On the Windows machine, on the server side, it's like opening a local Unix domain socket in Unix speak. And this is, in fact, what we do with the implementation that I'm going to show you. Um, it's like some, so you have a process server side called server service daemon, probably, um, that opens a local Unix domain socket that, via means of SMB, is available to the network. With the benefit of all crypto that is around, so signing can be done, you get, and this is part of one further slide, you get all the authentication already done. If you want to, um, you get encryption and, and signing. And, and so for this server service stuff, or for this Unix domain socket equivalent, it's a named pipe in Windows speak, you get the transport or via SMB for free. So we create a file, we open a file. What this means is essentially we connect to a socket on the server side locally. Daemon starts to offer server service. Step two. We do an RPC bind. Let's look at this RPC bind. Call. So where is it? So we write data into this named pipe, and part of this data is this here. That's a GUID to tell the server, hey, I offer server service as a socket server side, but it's possible on the same socket to offer a whole bunch of different services, interfaces in um, RPC speak. So it's the server, server service is saying, I offer the server service, here are the subcategories. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So essentially different, really, interfaces in Java speak or different whatever, yeah. Number. Not, yes, possibly. <laughs> yes. If, if the pipe server service is an IP address, this is a port number. Um, yes, so, but dynamically or statically assigned. So the first thing is we connect to that daemon. Daemon offers 20 interfaces, and we tell the daemon, hey, I want to list shares or participate in any of these interfaces in any of the RPC calls offered on this interface. And by the way, I can also do 64-bit encoding, and so on. And there's also, I could optionally, inside the already authenticated SMB session, I could optionally do yet another thing that you would, in the SMB world, call session setup. You could optionally send a Kerberos ticket to, do, to be somebody else, and so on. This is made for running directly on top of TCP. So same traffic goes on directly on TCP. And if you offer this on TCP, of course, you need to authenticate. Here, the authentication kind of is optional. So we have an authentication link of length of zero here, which makes it easy, which is, I don't know, equivalent to guest, or it inherits the SMB layer authentication, or token, rather. OK. Server service says, hey, yes, I offer this. Fine. And by the way, I'm able to accept chunks of four kilobytes plus a bit. OK. What you can also do as part of the bind request, you can separately negotiate all sorts of crypto. 
And this has made it possible, for example, in the early days to have unauthenticated SMB or unsigned SMB and then run the authentication service Windows domains provide, the net logon with the credential chain with a special authentication wrapping around it. So probably because this was a way for them to get around some crypto export problems. Just, I mean, there's separate layering. You have the SMB layering, you have the SMB layer, and then inside, using this as a transport, you have a separate um, negotiation for cryptographic, plain text, signed seal, and so on. Also different flavors. Okay. What do, we have, what do we have at this point? When this has come back, this, by the way, is used to be, I think, a read, read request. Yes, it's a read response. So after this request, we are basically done. We have a proper channel to the RPC server that knows, now I'm gonna talk, uh, I'm gonna ask you for the listing of shares. And what we do here is we ask it for net share enum all. Just one of these RPC calls inside server service. And this actually is, in this case, an IO control request. Yes, Ronnie? This is a Windows client talking to us. Ah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to Windows. Talk to Microsoft about. But this, this is part of the problem, why it's so hard. So the question was, why am there's two equivalent ways of transmitting data on top of a name pipe. First is with, with write and read. The other one, as Ronnie uses it, as Ronnie said, is with I.O. control, which is much simpler. But this is part of the problem that you have to implement both. Gordon. I think the answer is that they don't know the right hand side yet, by the way. And in crypto, the, uh, if you do an auto, you should be more than right. The answer was before doing the error control, they have to do the read write because they don't know the fragment size yet, which was sent to them in the bind egg here. Yeah, we have fragments. So, and now they know that we can, we can actually do IO controls small enough in something. I mean, by the way, for the real expert on the details, ask Mets um, and Samuel. They know all about this. I've, I've basically just done the plumbing to get this service out of Samba or sufficiently separated out of Samba <laughs> to, to make it available. Okay, now we are ready, after a few steps, we are ready to answer, uh, to answer the question, hey, this is our list of shares and Another thing, if you look at Wireshark, pointer to level U, pointer to level, and pointer to container, pointer to something. The, this is a container. Multi-level stuff with referent ID with count, pointer to an array. No, I don't want to do this. I definitely don't want to have this encoded manually, properly, and Ronnie can probably tell you that this is not real fun to actually, in its full beauty, marshal and unmarshal. Okay. So, what we have is we have SMB, read and write. We have a layer on top that is called DCRPC. It's a highly popular by the number of clients that speak it every day, highly popular flavor. It runs over everything. Everything that can ship bytes, even IPX, can do RPC. It's the basis for, for all the Windows component programming. It's the basis for distributed component object model and so on, and a lot more. It's probably by the number of packets being sent, um, used more than NFS. Maybe REST is more popular these days, but it's still really highly used because all Windows workstations completely depend on it. However, if you search for it with your popular search engine, you find this. And what is it? I went to 
the defining open group for DCRPC. So I went to the Wikipedia article. DCRPC, it sent me to the open group. And then it sent me, the, the page from the open group sent me, oh, and here you can download our, our reference implementation. And you get this. Now you do a little further search and you can end up with DCE RPC on GitHub. And this is probably a bit hard to see. I couldn't really find a way to make that scale better, but what is this? This is the code frequency on GitHub for the free DCE project. And there are a few spikes and the number that I have down here is January, January 2011. What does it mean? This, it, oh yeah, it's complete. No security bugs. It's fully featured, complete. It's dead. I mean, it's basically dead. Um, if you look at the Git log, it it's, seems to be owned by Apple, or at least James Peach is the one who contributes to it. But for a few years, there's not much more than just a few, re, uh, few make file fixes or compile time fixes or something. There is no real feature development, no, no security, no nothing. I mean, it is supposed to be a full DCRPC implementation with middle, with everything, but I, if I was to expose this on the network, I wouldn't really trust it. Pun? Yeah, fully supported, thriving. Yeah, sure, but I mean, I haven't seen much contribution in the Git log from from XID. Possibly. I, I, I didn't really look deeply. It's just, I just like this. Okay, it stopped in 2011. Just for the <laughs> effect. Okay, Samba RPC. Um, started in the mid 90s. Luke Kenneth Kesson Leeton wrote a book about this, and the first impression that you get is exactly what Ronnie had faced. There's a whole bunch of layering of fragmentation of trans to something requests of read and write, and nobody understood actually what it was. And his goal was Windows domain interoperability at that point, essentially become a domain member and also become a domain controller. And as I said a few slides before, um, this was the standard protocol for Windows domains. And we started out with hand marshaling packets, exactly what Ronnie has described in his talk. Um, and hand marshaling packets is still done today. If, for example, you look at the um, SIFSD kernel, the user space part of it um, uses hand marshaling. And for us, this is not really an option because we need, we want, and we need to do much, much more in the RPC space than just as a client or server list shares. And probably your implementation of SMB also wants to do much more than just list shares. And Metze said to me, well, if, you, if all you want to do as a client is to list shares, hand marshaling might be an option, it might be good enough, but if you also want to do the name to SID translation, that's a nightmare on, on its own. It's LSA, the LSA lookup names, lookup SIDs call, that kind of different options, different arrays inside to, that you have to marshal and so on. So, because we were at that time even a domain controller, we had a lot of bugs with not getting the marshalling for the RPC calls quite right. And also Günther can tell you a lot of stories about the printing stuff, I believe, where we didn't get that quite right. And so Android Fisher started a Perl IDL compiler um, to take the normal DCRPC IDL files and um, turn them into C code that can do the marshalling once and forever correct. I mean, that took a while to actually be once and forever correct, but right now we are pretty much happy with it. There are still some omissions that we don't do, and there's also quite a few extensions. For example, we do DNS marshalling using Piddle. We do DCRPC header marshalling using Piddle. So this has evolved into our 
because we had to do the NDR stuff anyway. This has evolved into our general, hey, we have this data structure, let's not do JSON out of it, but do NDR or something else. So whenever we now have to marshal, unmarshal something, we use Piddle, with maybe the exception of ASN1, but maybe somebody, <laughs> sorry, Jeremy, you should have seen Jeremy. Okay, the main difference between um, the middle that you find in free DCE and Piddle is the C output is actually kind of readable. And this is, for us, has been a very important aspect to actually do the debugging to make sure that we don't have security bugs, which inevitably, of course, happened, but as we could take a look at the C output, we had security problems there in the generated code, but we could then fix it once and for all, and this particular array handling bug was no longer there. So, back to the history. This was still at the time when Microsoft held their IDL files completely secret, and it was still a lot of, there was a tool to regenerate these in a complete, what? Novel. Yes, there, were, there used to be a tool that you could run on Windows, completely legal, and extract IDL files, I believe, something like that. And, but still, they were being seen as a trade secret for Microsoft, and this was a big part of the European Union Commission versus Microsoft case, and I still remember some Microsoft engineer coming up to us during these sessions there, and you just want the idea else, I would give it to you, but that was an engineer. <laughs> you, uh, if I just dumped the idea else on you, it would take you years to implement the code behind it, and he was so right, but the idea else at that point were still secret, and luckily, these days are long gone. Um, it's now completely public. If you look at the SAMR netlog on server service, you get the full IDLs, you get a description of the calls. So this is now fully documented. Thank you, EU. Okay, I have another little story um, for DCRPC encoding. Can you read this? Okay, let me look at the code. And I still have the, from the previous talk, um, so three, rpc, idl, users.idl. Okay, so this is part of an IDL file. Just, yeah, Ronnie? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, the code for this stuff. Yes. Uh, the other word that starts with R is stuff. Uh, R engineer is stuff. Not this. But uh, the code for this stuff we can use. What we just need to is a um, uh, common idiom in a Microsoft uh, mm -hmm. idea. Not the case of course in the world that Ronnie's comment was, once you got used to it, um, it was okay. I would say it was an acquired taste. <laughs> really, I mean, it's, this is just ugly to me. So imagine you have this set of protocol elements as part of an RPC core, and this is encoded with NDR. And right now, this is not really RPC. It's just our use of Piddle to marshal some kind of structure with an array, and that's the important piece, into a blob that using RPC you would send on to the wire to the server. Just looking at this, who can say what field, what element would show up first on the wire? Stefan, you shut up. <laughs> Just make a guess. Yes, I would have guessed current state. No. Because this is a conformant, yeah, Ronnie? Yes, 
Yes, thank you. The first four bytes were num files. So just for, so and what I did, or what Metz told me to do is just change it to this. And this is a piddle extension and you're fine. You have the current state at the very beginning and this is what I want, wanted to have. But I mean, how weird is this? You have this kind of language and it describes nicely, okay, we have a UN32, we want alignment, we have another UN32, we want alignment, but no. By the way, if it had been like, if we had two arrays of those, which we have here, two arrays, then of course the sequence number shows up first. Yeah? Yeah, great, thank you. <laughs> As I said, for the details, ask this guy. So, summing up, you don't want that. Trust me. So, Samba's RPC implementation. Right now, we are RPC server for like maybe 20 services or so. I don't really know, but it's roughly that number of services. Um, by default, they are all directly linked into, our, uh, into SMBD. They are all offered locally. And why did we do that? Well, no real reason behind it. It's kind of historic because when we started this, we weren't aware of the layering that we could have done. Essentially, yes, this is the whole transport thing and we could do a Unix domain socket and if we, had, if we would start from scratch, we would do it completely differently. But, oh, we had this netlock on pipe open thing and somebody wrote into this and before we actually then go into a real pipe, we didn't know much, we didn't know about enough about this in the mid 90s um, to actually do it right. And so this came later. It's easy to implement, but not the right thing. And in May 2010, Simul Sorge started out to split out all our printing subsystem, which is a huge RPC server that is really ugly, at least from our perspective. Um, and now the insight synced in that SMB is just a transport for RPC traffic. And so he wanted to completely separate it. And what he did is he created code to have this RPC traffic pass through a Unix domain socket. And this talk essentially builds upon that work. And so the good thing is from our perspective or from our customer's perspective, this is mainly maybe a Zana talk, from our customer's perspective is that this socket we see is a GPL boundary. So Samba RPC is all GPL, but it's a standard protocol. It's a standard RPC mechanism. There's examples on both sides with different implementations. So from all perspectives, this is a completely clean library, a clean license boundary. And this is, this is why this talk exists. Because I mean, you have your own proprietary SMB server that is fancy. You don't want to link into Samba because then you have the GPL obligations. But if you just talk to us via that Unix domain socket that I'm gonna show you in the next slide, um, you're done. You don't have to do GPL. Demo time. Okay. So, we have an SMBD here, or we have rather a special configuration for Samba. So, this is an SMB.conf, and by the way, this client protocol was just from the previous talk because the tests I did there was just on, were just on SMB1. Okay, this is a very simple thing of what an SMB implementer would implement. So this just describes, or this just configures Samba, a normal SMB server, in a way that when it gets a connection attempt to server service, don't do it yourself. As I said, Samba does it all itself, all embedded and so on. But this is the configuration how to say, okay, server service is done externally, please send it to somebody else. I start this as a MIDI. Mm. So. Wait. 
Where is it? I have done this. Ah, wait a second. This is This is just a bit for the demo thing here. Okay, we have an SMBD here running and we can RPC client into it. RPC client obviously is our sample tool from what Windows would do when listing shares. And I'm listing shares by, let me just put this on top. I'm listing shares by doing net share enum all. This triggers exactly that sequence that we have seen in the Wireshark trace, connect to server service, do the bind, do the net share enum all, and list that stuff. And just for demonstration purposes, let me go to a different screen. SMB status, S trace, net share enum all, hey, object name not found. And why is that? What this SMBD does is it tries to connect to a special Unix domain socket. And this is exactly what another SMB2 server would do. It gets from the client the request to open server service. And this in the back end will just not do anything but this connect call. And because there's nobody listening here, well, we get object name not found. Now, let's start server service. And this is one that you could then ship. And this is the one that will host this server service socket that I've just shown to you. Ah, can you read that? Let me just make that a bit smaller in screen real estate. That's an LSOF output. It shouldn't have done LSASS. Okay, this version does both. This version, as I said, it can offer many services simultaneously. So this version now has a listening socket on this path, and that can now be connected to via your cool SMB server. Okay, now let's do the S trace again. Hey, ta-da. Okay, no change to the SMB server, to the SMB configuration. Let's look at what happened behind the scenes. Okay, SMB connects here. And, ah, I'll get to that, I'll get to, where is my laser pointer? I'll get to, this line in a minute. So, wait a second. Essentially what is happening is with socket 33, we connect to this Unix domain socket and then we pass back and forth, read, read, packets. And so that means that on behalf of the Windows client, which just uses read and write and I.O. control, your SMB server will just convey this exactly as it comes back and forth on the wire to us. 
38 here is probably the SMB client. Yes, that's the SMB client socket. And so we get an I.O. control or a read and write call from the client. And this means that in the back end, so here we get bytes from the client, like 192 bytes as part of a SMB write, for example, for the bind call to the RPC server. And we just one-to-one -one pass this on to socket 33 as a transport and let that guy deal with it. So the task of the SMB server has become much simpler, just a pure transport of stuff. No, not having to deal with all this DCRPC madness. Okay. Demo. There's one little complication. Um, as I said, when using RPC inside SMB, the RPC traffic can utilize the authentication that has happened external to it. The RPC bind can use its own authentication, but most Windows clients for this particular call don't. Um, they could, but they don't. They rely on the SMB authentication information having happened and having been passed to the socket, uh, to the RPC server. It's like Zazel external. Like when you authenticate to a TLS socket using your client certificate and so on, the Zazel external authentication mechanism for your IMAP in, inside or something or LDAP or whatever can just utilize the authentication that has happened in the transport layer. Okay, no fire alarm. Has happened in the transport layer and just use it for the IMAP slash SMTB slash something layer in between. And this, what we have here, is similar. So you have the SMB wrapping for RPC traffic. And what we do is we can pass as part of the initial exchange when we connect to that server service socket, we just hand over all the authentication that we have done. And that's in particular it's the user token and a session key that some of these calls do. And yeah, the way Samba does it usually is DCRPC and DR encoded. Pardon? Oh, sorry. Um, is NDR encoded, but wait, this is what we wanted to get rid of. This is what the RPC server really doesn't want to deal, uh, the SMB server, sorry, really doesn't want to deal with. So what we did as part of this project is, and this is not upstream, if we could separate that out cleanly, we could do that. Um, if you look at the first few lines here, after connecting to that socket, Here, we connect to that socket, and if you happen to be able to read this, this is JavaScript. So, our code typically goes and uh, RPC, libRPC, IDL, um, named pipe auth, what we do between our services, we have RPC around, is we pass on this structure here that has all sorts of nested arrays, something, it has strings, so not really easy to pass. And we in particular have this auth, info, auth session info transport, get another whatever list of SIDs and Unix token and session information and key and so on. and you don't really, you wanted to get out of this NDR business. And this is NDR encoded, and so what we did is, for this initial project, we just encoded some, something that is directly required for NetShare Enum, and where is it? It's just a version, here, it's just a version, and we get some very simple reply from the client, uh, from the implementing server, that is relevant for the SMB, and how to actually communicate. That's something with message mode or byte mode pipes for details, 
contact us later. So all this initial exchange to pass on the authentication and key information to the RPC server is done with JSON. It's incomplete, but it's all that's needed for server service at this point. If we want to do SEMR, we need to use the session key. If we want to do full authentication here, we need to do more, but that's easy to extend. Yeah, so that's my talk. So what happens is we have extract, we have essentially written an RPC server that anybody can talk to over Unix domain that is easy to extend to also listen on TCP that can then be talked to by any kind of SMB implementation. It would be great if we could then talk, for example, to the people from the next call that SIFSD in the kernel could talk to us. I mean, this is what really would make it useful that the in-kernel SIF server, maybe Gordon's server could talk to us for RPC. The difficulty that we have now, this, the implementation for all these services also relies on Samba infrastructure. For example, listing shares. Where do we get the list of shares from? SMB.conf or registry or something. But this is then relatively easy. You got rid of all the RPC traffic, just querying some database to list shares. That's now easy to implement. And this could be done, of course, also in GPL version, whatever. You provide us with a stripped down SMB.conf that we can just use as a fake and just list shares. You get the idea. Once you start going deeper into other RPC services, the RPC server implementation has to integrate more closely with your implementation. But that's then details that can be sorted out later. Any questions? Jeremy. Documentation. That's the key. You're going to have to document how yeah. third party vendors talk to the service vendors, you know, provide a, an maybe a, a sample. Yeah. So it's not someone in Winbind. Jeremy, Winbind is actually well, very well documented. Um, sorry, Jeremy's, uh, Jeremy's um, comment was about documentation. Um, yes, of course. This is, this is a Zenit customer project. And so we talk to them. And um, what I have in mind is to work on the RP, to trim down SABD and make this model the standard implementation for Samba. And at that point, it's really worthwhile to document that properly. Yeah, Gordon. Um, yes, we've thought about this. I mean, this was a few years ago. Um, Piddle, the, the IDL files, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the IDL files and the pure Piddle output that we generate from it, we see as entirely permissive. Do whatever you want with it. However, because it's readable C code, it, con it calls out into a relatively rich library. And that's the piece, yeah, I'm almost done here. That's the piece that is right now GPL, it's a few thousand lines of code. It's like NDR push U in 32, NDR pull string and all that stuff um, that could be rewritten. I would expect very few months of work. Or maybe yeah, possibly relicense. So yes, this is something that we have considered, but we re haven't really followed through with it. It's, it's nothing that we would see as our core IP. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His comment was that we are not the earth. We are not the first one of this obvious idea. Not, not invented by either of us. Windows does something similar. Yeah, of course. Different APIs. So there was a question back there. Um, the question was, can we do more than share enumeration? Yes, of course, you can do anything. However, then, if you want to do, for example, file enumeration and file close remote and so on, um, you will have the RPC server implementation talk to your 
file listing. So, I mean, right now we are, I mean, if you have listened to my previous talk, how do we list files? We enumerate locking.tdb. You don't have a locking.tdb. So you would have to change the implementation, um, but we give you a call that you can plug into then. But then, but then you might be careful with the license again, because you're then into GPL at this point, because I mean, the, the pure marshalling is one thing, but the whole RPC server implementation that has much more with authentication and all that stuff, we wouldn't really be able to relicense that easily. So these RPC calls would call into an API that you provide or look at your data structures, but this needs to be GPL then, which is maybe it might or not, might not be okay, but yes. More questions? No. I mean, well, yes, of course, there's a performance of overhead, but um, RPC is not really the hot code path. Definitely not. Um, so, yes, I mean, we, do, we even do that internally. So, um, this, is not, this is not your first concern. There's so much marshalling going on, your mallocs will kill you anyway. Yes? Um, I'm not, so the question was about what to do about huge number of shares that don't fit into a single RPC call. Um, this is, an, we, we do that of course. We can list thousands of shares and I don't have a good picture in mind right now how to plug that into your implementation, how to whatever f list the first ones. This is something, I don't have a good picture. I would need to look at your APIs. But it's possible. Yes, it's entirely possible. In theory, of course, yes. So what we have is saw three RPC, saw three RPC, so, um, RPC server, server service. Net share enum all. So what you get is this call here, we call, so this is Samba code and you have to fill in this. And what right now happens in Samba, this is the core of the share enumeration stuff and part of that is a resume handle that we pass back and forth between us and the client. And so this would be part of your implementation. Hey, give us this kind of function to get us the next 500 of these. So yeah, we do that. I think I'm done uh, time-wise. So maybe there's a coffee break, I don't know. There's sugar out there. <laughs>